no, I'll go far. We're, we're still have like two or three minutes still, so we're good. San Diego on a slow day. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right there is okay, sir? Yeah, I think that's, that's fine. Good. Okay. As long as it's not broken against the shirt. No. Um, Testing? Yeah. Okay. No, we don't have that. Okay. Wow. Awesome. Um, I, 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 my voice doesn't sound any different. Oh, no, it, it, the audio. audio's not on yet. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, just so you this know, is a small room. Yeah, I really don't need this for people to hear me, but okay. We're actually recording this for the web. It's live oh, you streaming are. and we're recording. Which Got also it. Uh, means that the, uh, the audience asks this question. Ask questions, Jonah's going to repeat them. Giselle For the benefit of the audience, Giselle. okay. He's not like acting like he can't hear. Okay. Fine. <laughs> yeah, who is, yes, 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 Jason Aaron says, like, I can hear the questions. Like, it's for the web. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's like, I'm not an idiot. So I'm sure like, no, everyone has asked them on. I think okay. like a minute or two. So That's I'll fine. No, I'm good. good. I'm good. <laughs> Peter, is there anything you particularly would like to talk about? I'll be happy to talk about whatever you want to talk about. Because uh, just remind me, when did you first start? What year did you first start in comics? First start in comics? Good question. Um, I became a full-time freelancer in 87. Okay. So 82, I guess. Okay. Because uh, I worked for Marvel in the direct sales department for five years. Right, right, right. Before right, right. I then became a full-time freelancer. Okay. And I'm pretty sure 87 was when I went freelance because it was the year that Dwight Gooden came back to the Mets. And I think that was 87. You're a big baseball fan, right? Oh, well, I'm a Mets fan, which is, you know, nothing I'm really proud of. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Clippers fan, oh. although I'm, I'm, I'm proud right now, but... Clippers isn't baseball, right? No, that's basketball. Okay, th to me, there's two seasons of the year. There's baseball season and there's winter. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't give a crap about football, hockey, soccer, basketball, any of that stuff. All right, we'll talk a little bit of baseball. Oh, your voice got Oh, my voice got loud. <laughs> cool. Welcome to the Secret Origins Room. I'm Jonah Weiland from Comic Book Resources uh, here at Emerald City Comic Con. And my current guest, Mr. Peter David, probably one of the most prolific writers currently in comics. Thank you Yay. for joining us. <laughs> we, we, oh, no, it's, that was not an audit prompt for this is where you say yay. <laughs> Although I do appreciate it. Let's start there. Most prolific okay. writer in comics. Do you think anybody else mat currently working in comics matches your career output? Oh, well, career output? Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> no, no, that's not true. Uh, Chris Claremont, for one thing, who's going to be writing the upcoming Nightcrawler series. So you guys are battling it out for... Oh, God, battling? No. Chris is way ahead of me. Really? Well, I mean, sure, he was writing X-Men when I first came to Marvel Comics. Okay, sure. So, you know, he's been, at, he's been there and at it, and, and he's still going, so... Certainly, Chris is in the lead. I've seen a lot of people come and go since I started my career, um, which I've been doing since, God, the mid-1980s. Right. But it's just kind of weird because, like, 20 years ago, I was writing X-Factor and Spider-Man 2099, and now it's 20 years later, and I'm going to be writing X-Factor and Spider-Man 2099. So <laughs> I'm really not quite sure what to make of that. <laughs> That's one of kind of the most amazing things about your career. I talked to you soon after you turned 50, and you were very grateful of the fact that you still had work in comics. Oh, yeah. Because this, this is not an industry that's always been kind to age. Uh, well, yeah, that's, that's pretty much true. On the other hand, as the editors are getting older, suddenly they seem to be revisiting the whole age thing. So Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's start with Spider-Man 2099, because when okay. you created that character, when that came out, yes. uh, it kind of blew me away, because uh, I was a big Spider-Man fan at the time, and mm -hmm. it was a little controversial, because it was a new look at Spider-Man, a, a future Spider-Man. Yes. Here he is coming back. What, talk about that character and your relationship with him all these years. Well, my relationship really goes back to Marvel approaching me, along with a number of other writers, and saying, we're going to be doing a 2099 series set in Marvel's future, and, and one of the lead characters is going to be Spider-Man 2099, and we'd be interested in your take on what you would do with him. So the first thing I thought was, well, the last thing we want to do is have him be a descendant of Peter Parker, because that is simply too freaking obvious. 
And what I did was I quite simply decided to zig everywhere that Stan and Steve zagged when they created Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. um, Peter Parker was an orphan, okay? Miguel, Miguel O'Hara would have a mother and a brother. Uh, Peter had no idea what to do with girls. Miguel was going to have a fiancé. Uh, Peter was a teenager. Miguel was going to be in his mid-20s. Um, Spider-Man would be... Uh, Peter was tended to be uh, kind of quiet when he was not in his costume. And as Spider-Man, he was a wiseacre. Spider-Man 2099 was the other way around. Miguel would tend to be a smartass when he was Miguel. When he was Spider-Man, he was totally focused on what he was doing and wasn't much for making wisecracks, that kind of thing. And I developed the character. I developed his, uh, his entire supporting cast, and I sent it into Marvel. And a week or so later, I got a call from the editors, and they said, we love your take on Spider-Man 2099. For starters, it was the only one that didn't start out with, he's a descendant of Peter Parker. <laughs> <laughs> I went, okay. And they said, would you be interested in writing the ongoing series? And I said, well, sure. And that's pretty much how it started. And Miguel's been rattling around in my head pretty much ever since. It's interesting. Your instinct was to go against the Peter Parker uh, yes. stuff. Uh, that was a pretty good argument for trusting your instincts based on... on I would say so, stuff. right. Do, uh, are you always... Are you, some people have good instincts, some people don't, and they have to get a lot of counsel. Are you kind of a guy who can trust his own instincts all the time? I tend to think so. I mean, particularly when it comes to comic books. I mean, I have been doing this since the mid-1980s. I have some idea of what I'm doing. Um, when I will embark on stories and I will have no clue uh, where the story's going to go when I first start. And somewhere around the middle of the issue, I generally tend to figure it out. Uh, I mean, for, I didn't know I was going to be running Spider-Man 2099 until a few weeks ago. Mm. I mean, word of the comic book broke a couple of months ago. And, and the moment it did, my email box lit up with everybody writing, going, are you going to be writing it? I'm going, writing what? You mm -hmm. know, I, I didn't know anything about it. And I was telling people, quite honestly, that I have no idea what they're talking about. If there is a Spider-Man 2099 comic, I certainly wish Marvel well. I don't have anything to do with it. And then a couple of weeks ago, I got a call from Ellie Pyle, who's now my editor on the series, and she says, so, we want to know if you're interested in doing Spider-Man 2099. And they're going, huh? <laughs> okay, sure. Good. The first issue is coming out in July. And this is like toward the end of March. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, I'm late. <laughs> you know, which is actually very commonplace on comic book. You know, welcome aboard. We're thrilled to have you aboard. By the way, you're a month behind on your deadline. Right, 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 right. Um, so I banged out the first issue without having a really clear idea of what I was going to do, but I f it focused in. And by page three or four, I was totally locked on to Miguel's personality again. It just came right back to me. Do you feel an ownership over that character? I try not to feel ownership over company-owned characters because it's, it flies in the face of legal actuality. Sure. It flies in the face of creative actuality. I have seen what happens to writers who become so emotionally attached to characters whom they don't own mm -hmm. when they wind up inevitably losing control of the characters. Some have become seriously devastated by it. Some have left comics because of it. Mm -hmm. So I decided many, many years ago not to let myself get too emotionally involved in what's going on with the characters or with my ownership of the characters. I learned to enjoy them while I'm writing the stories, and that's pretty much it. When you were younger, was there ever a moment where you did have that weakness? It's like, oh, man, I can't believe I'm not writing this character anymore. When I was younger, no. No. No, it never occurred. It never occurred. When I was younger, it never occurred to me that you could write comic books. Right. You know, I really didn't understand. Oh, I meant earlier in your career. I mean. Oh, earlier in my career. Yeah. No. No, okay. No, I, I, I was pretty much on that from the beginning. There are, you know, I, I was just telling uh, the production staff back there uh, before you came, I was like, this is going to be both the easiest and the hardest interview of the day. Okay. It's easy because I, I, I've interviewed you before. I've seen you and said okay. like this before. You, you always shine. Thank you. But you have a million different places that we could start and talk about. Sure. So I'm just going to go to the areas where I became aware of you. And the okay. two places I became aware of you first uh, when I first started reading comics was uh, with Incredible Hulk and okay. your But I Digress column in oh. Comic Spires Guide. Okay. Loved both. Oh, thank you. And let's start with Incredible Hulk okay. because that's, first off, an incredibly long run. Nobody Twelve else really, years. Yeah, yeah, nobody else really wanted to do Incredible Hulk when you took it over and you, nope. you made it your own. You, you put your imprint on it. And you also launched 
amazing careers, uh, amazing artistic careers on that book. Well, I would like to take credit for it, but I can't really. I mean, the editors were picked. The, the editors were the ones who picked the artist. Um, I mean, for instance, uh, when I first started on the book, Bob Harris called me into his office and said, "Look, I have this guy who I want to have on the book because I think he's got some real potential, but." I'm not sure what to do with him because I tried to put him on G.I. Joe and Larry Hama said no way because his artwork's not ready and I don't want to have to deal with him on G.I. Joe. Take a look at his artwork and he showed me his work on Infinity Inc. which he'd been doing for DC Comics and I looked it over and I, knew, and I saw that he was kind of raw and he needed some work and he needed to get rid of all the stupid panel layouts that he was doing but I thought that there was real potential there and I said okay let's have this Todd McFarlane work on Incredible Hulk. Right. And, you know, since then he's disappeared into obscurity, of course. <laughs> um, but, yeah, the, the artists have always been selected by the editors. It's, sure. it's very rare that I've had the opportunity to say, this is the artist that I want. But the editors have But it done, was on your books that yes, they became known. that's true. That's true. I mean, one of the greatest things Todd ever said to me was at a convention where um, he was at that point drawing Spider-Man. And he said he really drew... He really enjoyed drawing Spider-Man. He was a character he'd always want to do. But boy, he missed my plots on The Incredible Hulk. And I was very flattered by that. It's interesting. Uh, we're going to mix this up. We're going to have some questions from the audience, and we'll come back to okay. you and me again. Uh, let's open it up for some questions. You, sir, in the Batman shirt. Uh, given your uh, history with the Captain Marvel, uh, what would be, are you, do you have any interest down the road of maybe uh, uh, writing the new the question is, would you have any interest in writing the new Captain Marvel, considering your history with the character? Okay, which one's the new Captain Marvel now? <laughs> <laughs> there have been so many freaking people with this title. There's Ms. Marvel, she's not the new Captain Which one's the new Captain? Uh, is it Carol Danvers now, yeah, Captain yes. Marvel? Yeah. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I enjoyed writing Janice Vell. I had a lot of fun with him. Um, he was a totally demented character. I had, a, I had a great deal of, it was really entertaining writing Jenna's. I was seriously bummed that they wound up killing Wolf. And, um, you know, I mean, I suppose we could bring him back. I mean, it's not exactly unprecedented to bring back, you know, previously dead characters. Uh, they, killed, you know, they killed off him. They killed off Vile of Vel. It's like, quick, Peter Davis, Captain Marvel. Let's erase any trace of his work on this book. Um, I don't think it was quite that personal, you know, but... Um, <laughs> But uh, I mean, if they came to me and they said, we want to bring back Jenna Zavell and we'd love to have you write them, I'd be totally aboard. I'm not really that interested in writing ca uh, Carol Danvers at this point. Okay. Uh, any other questions before we move on? Go What's ahead, sir. What's your favorite character to write? What's your favorite character to write? My favorite character to write? I have a bunch of them. I mean, it's like saying, which one is your favorite child? I mean, I wrote The Hulk for 12 years. I love writing The Hulk. Uh, I wrote X Factor. I love writing Jamie Madrox. I love writing Layla Miller. When I first started on X Factor, you know, everyone hated Layla Miller because she was, to all intents and purposes, a plot device that was created for the House of M series. And I said, within a year, I'm going to have Layla Miller be like everyone's favorite character. And sure enough, within a year, people love Layla Miller. So I was very, very pleased about that. Mm -hmm. uh, Spider Man 2099 is one of my all time favorites because I created him from the ground up. Um, Fallen Angel, a series that I do for IDW. Uh, another character that I created from the ground up. If we're in no the world of novels, Sir Apropos of Nothing, which was a s book series that I did, uh, which was a lot of fun. So, um, you know, there, there is no one. I would love to say there is, but there really isn't. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. How, uh, how frequently or infrequently do sociopolitical issues influence your storyline? How frequently or infrequently do sociopolitical issues influence your comics? That's what he just asked. I know, it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. So that's where you're getting your questions from. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Um, only if it seems appropriate to the story. It's very rare that something comes along that's so important that I say, I have to write a story about this, or I have to work this into a story. Um, that, that rarely happens. It has happened. I mean, I decided I wanted to do a story about AIDS, so we gave Jim Wilson AIDS and killed him off. You know, that's, I wanted to do a story about AIDS because I thought it was important. I wanted to do a story about capital punishment, so I created a character named Crazy Eight, and we executed her. 
a story that I'm particularly proud of because I got angry letters from liberals telling me that I had written a letter, I had written a comic book that endorsed capital punishment, and I got angry letters from conservatives telling me that I'd written a comic book that, uh, that um, uh, belittled capital punishment. So I actually managed to piss off people on both sides with one story. <laughs> so that was, that was something of an accomplishment. Um, sometimes they will crop up. For, ex for example, I decided to have Monet state that she was a Muslim. Why not? Everyone was so busy trashing Muslims, I said, this is ridiculous. I'm a Jew. It wasn't all that long ago that people didn't want to have synagogues in their neighborhoods, and now all of a sudden we have people who are organizing movements to have Muslims not have wor places of worship in their neighborhoods, and a number of the people who are organizing this are Jewish, which is an irony that uh, apparently I appreciate, but none of them do. <laughs> um, and so I wound up having Monet say, yeah, I'm a Muslim. Because why not? I mean, her mother comes from a country that's 95% Muslim. If Monet is in Muslim, there's something a little bit wrong. You know? I did that for socio-political reasons. But for the most part, I tend to try and keep my opinions to myself. Um, Sometimes I kind of back into it. For example, I wrote X Factor 45, and I had Shatterstar come back. And in the last page, I had, you know, Shatterstar was under this brain control thing, and he was fighting Richter. And in the last page, I had Shatterstar snap free from the brain control thing. And there's Shatterstar and Richter face to face for the first time in God knows how long. And we've been hinting at this relationship between the two of them, but it never spelled it out. And I'm sitting there, I'm going, you know what, screw it. It's the 21st century. Why are we, part of the expression, dicking around with this? <laughs> let's just be out. Let's be honest about it. And so I had Shatterstar kiss Richter on the mouth. And Richter was not shying away. And I, then I had Guido go, oh, okay, I wasn't expecting that. And <laughs> to me, that was, pa you know, it wasn't a big deal. It was panel five of a six panel page, you know? So it wasn't like there was a huge amount of emphasis on it to me. It was just simply, you know what? We've had them be tacit lovers for 20 years, enough screwing around. Let's just, let's just tell that story and get on with it. And that was my feeling on it. The next thing I knew, it exploded. And suddenly it was this whole socio-political thing with Peter David, and I thought this was hysterical, trying to do sensationalistic stories. <laughs> and I'm going, if I was doing it sensationalistic, I would have had their lips coming towards each other on the last panel and end it there. And then have you wonder next month, right. what will happen? No, they kissed on page 22 because it was the last page of the book. Done. Um, <laughs> and it exploded. I mean, I was getting Google alerts from everywhere. I mean, it was in Russia. I'm looking at Russia. Really? And and yeah, I was, I was getting Google alerts from this newspaper in Russia in which it was like, you know, the whole thing's in Russia, and I saw my name, <laughs> <laughs> and I saw Shatterstar, and there was the, the panel yeah. that was clipped out, and it's got a whole bunch of, you know, real political advertising. And it's like, okay, fine, as long as people buy the book, I'm happy. <laughs> and then it started to die down, and then Rob Liefeld got involved. Um, and Rob Liefeld said, no, no, no. Shatterstar is not gay at all. He would never have anything to do with gay. He's, he's a soldier, like, like an ancient Greek soldier. And I'm going... <laughs> <laughs> and, like, the moment Rob said that, the internet lit up again. <laughs> it's like, dude! <laughs> you know what the ancient Greek soldiers did before they went into battle, right? <laughs> they stooped young boys. And then the young boys would go on to become Greek soldiers. I mean, it was their recruiting drive, you know? <laughs> um, and of all things for Rob to say, it's like, okay, and it's like, I understood his sentiment. His feeling was, no, I created this character. He's not gay. <coughs> okay, fine. He's totally within his rights to say that. I totally get that he was upset. I'm sorry that he feels I did it to be sensationalistic when all I was doing was simply making explicit something that had been implied right. for 20 some years. But that was my mind to it. The thing that he added about the Greek soldiers brought to a whole new level. That was, <laughs> that was terrific. You, you, you say you don't put a lot of, um, you don't purposely put a lot of sociopolitical stuff in your work, on occasion. But you are certainly, and always have been, going back to your But I Dare I Guess column, very outspoken. I'm curious, how is that, 
How often has that affected your <coughs> career negatively? Because you, you don't hold back your opinion on no. politics, on other people in the industry. You never do. The only time it, well, let's see, it probably impacted my career negatively on, it, with DC Comics because I was criticizing them in print and they kind of, you know, stopped hiring me. And I <laughs> tend to think there may be an association there. There might be. <laughs> um, the only time it really kind of had a negative impact momentarily on my career was when I spoke out publicly about um, Marvel's plans to raise the price on Captain Marvel. Mm. And, you know, because Joe had talked about it, per, you know, in public. So I talked about it in public. And that, that got a little hairy there. I mean, I knew that I was putting my career at Marvel on the line there, you know, publicly criticizing Joe. For, and my understanding was that initially he was really pissed off. But then he saw that I was just doing what he and Bennis, Bennis? No, um, oh, God. Bill Jemis? Jemis, that's right. But he and Bill Jemis had been doing, which was taking stuff public and doing this whole kind of wrestling, you know, hype type of stuff publicly. Yeah. And once he came to that realization, he cooled down about it and then came up with the whole you decide nonsense yeah. that we did for, you know, like, you know, six months or something like that. And it kept Captain Marvel around for another couple of years and kept the price down, so I was happy about that. But that, that put my career at risk. If Joe had not gotten over that, I wouldn't be sitting here talking about my current projects at Marvel Comics. Interesting. Uh, any more questions from the audience here? Go ahead. Uh, is there anything that we can know about what's going on with Spider-Man 2099? What can we know about your plans for Spider-Man 2099? Well, we are keeping them in modern day for the time being. Um, we, for those people, you probably all know this, but... Uh, Dan Slott brought him into uh, Superior Spider-Man, much to my surprise. Um, going like, oh, it's Miguel. Okay, that's nice. Um, you know, so no, that was not cleared ahead of time with me or anything. It's just, you know, I'm reading Superior Spider-Man, and oh, look, it's Miguel Hara. Okay, hey, I created him, didn't I? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Which always breaks me up. I mean, people are making a big deal about, you know, Ultimate Spider-Man, you know. Now he's black, and I'm going, yeah, when I did you know, Spidey 29, he was half Mexican. Yeah. You know, and oh my God, the movie Spider-Man's going to have organic webbing. And I'm going, yeah, uh, <laughs> did that 10 years ago. You know. <laughs> um, fine, or whatever. Um, but at any rate, um, so he will be staying in modern day, at least for the time being. Um, in the very first issue, we're going to, ha I'm, I'm bringing back a group that I had introduced back in Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man, an organization called Totem, which is, operates out of the year 2211 and attempts to undo temporal mistakes. And they'll be sending one of their people to temporally fix Miguel O'Hara by wiping him out of existence in modern day, which obviously he's not you know, a really big fan of. <coughs> then we're going to be following up with the Spider Slayer story that uh, Dan did, because at the end of that, we saw that the Spider Slayers were being sold to somebody, and we're going to be revealing who that is, and Miguel's going to get pulled into that whole thing. And then we're going to be part of the whole Spider Universe thing that's going to be coming up uh, the latter part of this year, that Dan's been telling me his plans for that, and it's insanely dementedly brilliant. I mean, it's just going to be a lot of fun. So if you're if you're either not a Spider-Man fan or you're someone who just tends to avoid these, you know, big crossovers, I would strongly suggest that you put that aside and check out Spider-Verse because it's going to be a hell of a lot of fun. And Spider-Man 2099 will be a part of that. And then at the end of Spider-Verse, it's going to be leaving him with a kind of unusual situation directly impacting on the 2099 universe. And that's going to be a lot of fun, and we'll be exploring that. So I got some cool stuff coming up. Uh, anybody else? Go ahead. Uh, you said you spoke out about the raising price of Captain Marvel. How do you feel about the price of comics today? How do you feel about the price of comics today? I think they're insanely expensive. I mean, you have to understand, when I was reading, when I first started reading comic books, you could get like eight or nine of them for a buck. It was, no, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was 12 cents a comic. And it was 22 pages, or however many it was. And now it's 20 pages, and it's, what, three ninety nine now? And I, I think it's, it's kind of insane. Um, I really do not envy you guys. I mean, I buy comic books, too, but I buy them at stores where I get huge discounts because, you know, I'm me. 
Um, <laughs> so that works out. But um, it is not an inexpensive endeavor. And there are people, there are people who are basically saying, I used to love comic books, but I can't afford them anymore. And I totally understand. There are people who are now buying them only in trade paperbacks because that turns out to be a much better bang for your buck. And again, I fully understand because the prices have just, it's just gotten kind of insane. And I feel badly for you. On the other hand, what are they going to do? Are they going to reduce them back to 12 cents? The comic book stores will go out of business. Because yes, the price of comic books have gone up. So have, la so have uh, uh, rent, so have electricity, so have telephone. Everything's gone up. And if the price of comic books drop back to 12 cents a book, or a dollar a book, or whatever, do we seriously think that as a result of that, we would have a massive inflow of new readers? Do we really think that if comic books went back to 12 cents, they would suddenly get in 10 times the current readership who are going to be checking it out? No. No, I think that the readership would stay exactly the same. Some people would buy more comic books, which is great, but I don't think the number of readers would increase. And I've seen people not bother with comic books that are free if it's not a title that they're interested in. So, yeah, I mean, the three ninety nine dollars price is a hell of a thing to have to deal with, and I do not envy you that. But um, I think it's pretty much what we're stuck with at the moment. I want to take you back to one of the earlier parts of your career, to a book dude, that I think... Dude, dude, oh, yeah. Dude. yeah. Flashback. <laughs> All right. If only we had special effects. Yeah, that'd um, be cool. Uh, a book that I think is still underappreciated all these many years later, Atlantis Chronicles. Ah. And I'm curious what you think of that book all these many years later, because that was one of your... I loved works. Atlantis Chronicles. Yeah. That was probably one of the most ambitious series that I ever did. Especially at that time in your career. You were just still starting, start, starting out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I was, you know, basically for those people who didn't read it, which is probably most of you here, um, Atlantis Chronicles was my attempt to flesh out the history of DC's Atlantis, which I pretty much did. I mean, does Aquaman show up in Atlantis Chronicles? Yes, on the last page, and he's an infant, you know? Um, so, you know, it was, it was an incredibly ambitious story, and at the time I was very heavily influenced by what was at the time one of my favorite TV series on the air, which was I, Claudius. And I tried to write a comic book equivalent of I, Claudius mm. with, you know, this big, sweeping, epic, generations-long story with plotting people and political intrigue and all this kind of stuff, and ran seven issues. And, and they were each oversized issues, too. They were, and Esteban Moroto did the pencils, and he did a wonderful Beautiful job, work, yeah. absolutely wonderful job. It was the first, it was also my first experience in writing full script, mm. because up until that point, I had largely written what was called Marvel style, which is pretty much writing the equivalent of a short story, except it's written in present tense. And you say, this is what's happening on pages one to three. This is what's happening on pages four to nine, and so on. Atlantis Chronicles, I spelled out every freaking panel, mm. because Esteban Roto was Spanish and did not speak a word of English. So we needed to have it translated by his daughter. And she did a wonderful job translating it. Even the place where she screwed up, it went great. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, for instance, for instance, in the first issue, I described a meteor was going to be, was approaching Earth and that the meteor hitting Earth would cause Atlantis to sink, which is a theory that a number of Adla Atlantean scholars mm -hmm. have put forward. And when we got to about page like 25, the meteor is getting closer. And what I wrote was, the meteor has now gotten closer. And for the first time, we can actually see the cracky face of the meteor as it gets closer. Now, by face, I'm in front. And we got the pages. <laughs> and there's a death's head skull yeah. in the meteor. Yep. And I'm looking at it, I'm going, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> and Bob Greenberger said, yeah. Um, apparently, his daughter mistranslated that as face. And that's what he drew. And I'm looking through it, and it's getting closer and closer. And you see this death's head skull. And Bob said, do you want me to have the people in, in art corrections fix it? And I said, no, you know what? Keep it. I mean, the thing is that if there's a meteor coming your way, and it's just a regular meteor, you have hope that you may survive. 
if this thing's got a death's head skull on it, you're going to get your ticket punched. <laughs> you know, that's it. It's coming for you. Um, and we left it in there, and I actually wound up working that into a, a storyline in Aquaman yeah. and ha explaining why in God's name it had an actual face card <laughs> in it. Um, so, you know, it was a mistake, but it worked out great. How often do those kind of happy accidents actually happen? Very rarely. That's amazing. Very rarely. An artist, I'll give you one where it didn't work. I was writing an issue, I was, uh, we were going to be reviving Dreadstar. It was a six issue series from Malibu. And I wrote the first page. And it was supposed to be this progressively closer shot on the surface of an alien planet. And I get the pages back, and I look what Ernie Chan has drawn, and for no reason that I can figure out, there's a helicopter in panel four. <laughs> <laughs> and it's firing away at the borders. And, I'm go and it, it was a military chopper. I'm going, the hell? I don't remember having a military chopper in the middle of my, what is this? Yeah. And I went back and I looked at it. And I found that what I had written was helicopter shot. <laughs> <laughs> of an alien planet. <laughs> and Ernie apparently had no idea that a helicopter <laughs> shot is a film term for a steady shot that is shot from a helicopter. A good example was the opening credits of Birdcage. That's like one long, steady yeah. helicopter shot. And so he drew a helicopter <laughs> in. And I had to write to the editor and say, as much as I appreciate Ernie's exceptionally accurate drawing of a Yui, will you get it the hell out of my alien planet? Because it really can't be there because there's no helicopters. It's an alien world. And, they, and Ernie apologized profusely and took it out. But I've always felt really bad about having to take out that helicopter. Because it was a good-looking helicopter. It was an excellent helicopter. <laughs> Let's stick with DC uh, a bit. Supergirl, a bo book you worked on for a very, very long time. Supergirl, let's talk about Supergirl and Aquaman, actually. Okay. Both books you worked for a very long time. I did. You, you have a huge, had a huge imprint on both characters at the time. Now, not so much. Not so much. How do you feel about that? Because I know, I, I especially about what? Well, Aquaman, you, you, it seemed like you were having a lot of fun with that character. I was. You gave him a hook. Come on. Yes. I gave him a harpoon. Why you gave him a everyone, harpoon, yeah. Why did Excuse everyone me. in the world freaking say hook? It's just the yeah. first word that comes to mind. But it's a harpoon. It is a harpoon. I mean, you don't shoot whales no. with a hook. No, you don't. Well, you could. <laughs> but it's not going to be. The hook will bounce off the whale. It's going to go, what the hell is that? You know, <laughs> But it, yeah, it's a freaking harpoon, so let's get our technology right. Well, now. reading both books, it yes. was clear you were enjoying the hell out of oh, yourself yeah. with both books. Yes, I was. With, were those highlights for you at DC? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That and Young Justice, yes. yeah. And Young Justice, uh, yeah, Young Justice. Aquaman, I was having, why is he walking around with a two? I don't know, never mind. Um, Aquaman was a lot of fun. And I really had to do a selling job to let, to let me uh, have his hand get eaten by piranha, because that was not easy. And I was having a lot of fun on Aquaman, and then I wound up leaving the book because I was getting all these contradictory editorial notes. Mm. I was things like, um, okay, we want to have Aquaman be shown to be a leader, but have him be by himself. <laughs> and we want to have lots of stories with political intrigue, but stay out of Atlantis. And it's like, what the hell? Mm -hmm. And I wound up saying, you know what? Screw it. I'm done. And I wound up walking off the book, and Eric Larson came on, much to his great joy. And he lasted for a year before the contradictory editorial uh, instructions got to him. And he basically left the book and said, Peter David was right, words that I have always treasured. <laughs> <laughs> I go, yeah, damn right I was right. Um, but yeah, I had a lot of fun uh, writing Aquaman. I had a lot of fun writing Supergirl. I am bummed to this day that they canceled it. Yeah. And... Um, no, really, I am. And um, to a certain degree, I, I mean, you know, it's not like I'm targeting the artist or anything, but I blame the cover artist for, uh, for that because um, I, was, I, was, I wanted to do this storyline in which I was going to have her encounter the Silver Age Supergirl. And I was sure that that would bring sales up. And they assigned this cover artist to do the covers for the first three issues, and he was terrible. 
I mean, he was freaking horrible. Mm. The interior art by Ed Bennis was fantastic. Mm. Ed knocked it out of the park. But DC didn't bother to show anyone the artwork of Ed Bennis. All they put out was the co this terrible cover artwork. And the retailers took one look at the cover artwork and said, oh, screw that, and they just cut their orders. And the book came out. And once the book came out and people started seeing the sales, the, the, the quality of the story, people were going, holy crap, ignore the cover. Buy the book for the story. And by the third issue, sales were skyrocketing. By the fifth issue of that storyline, we had doubled our sales on Supergirl. That's very we unusual. Were, we, we, it was insanely unusual. We had doubled our sales on Supergirl. We were now way above the cancellation level. Unfortunately, DC and their infinite brilliance had already canceled the book. Mm. Um, so, you know, that was intelligent. They actually wound up collecting those last issues in a trade paperback. And that time, the cover was done by Ed Bennis. And he basically did his Ed Bennis version of the original cover. And a number of retailers told me, if that had been the cover for the first issue, I would have doubled my sales right then. Mm. Because, you know, so it's... It was really frustrating with the, with that uh, with the cancellation of Supergirl, but I did have a lot of fun with it. Let's continue on on, on this question about this this topic of sales because um, uh, you're an old school comic book fan. I am too. Uh, I, I was always a fan of the long numbering. I loved getting a book that was like at six fifty, seven hundred. Right. I love that stuff. That's not happening anymore. That's not happening anymore nope. at all. I'm curious, and, and it's happening with you right now. All new X Factor number one. <laughs> what, what do you think about this numbering debate? Uh, is it something you I can really find? I swear against? to God, if I were doing, if I were running a comic book company, I would get rid of numbers entirely. Mm. I'm done. I'm done. I'm freaking done with it. I would start every year, just you know, you know, next year, January 2015, February 2015, March, April, so through to the end of December, and then the following year, January 2016. I'd be done with it because if you have the month and the year. That's all people need to be able to follow the sequence. True. And the whole numbering thing has just become this, this insane thing. I mean... It's a sales tool. It, yeah, that's, that's what it's become because people will buy <coughs> in first issues. They will buy number ones where they will not buy issue 345 or 346 because they'll look at it and go, well, 345, I don't have to buy 344 previous issues. Screw that. I'll just wait till it starts over with a number one, which, you know, nowadays is a pretty much accurate perception of how it happens. And um, I, just, I just really think at this point there's so much emphasis on number ones, and I don't even understand it because screw number ones. You should be buying number twos. Yeah, that's because, where the story really starts to take up, yeah. Well, no, screw the story. It's where the, it's the retailers will order, like, X number of copies of number one, and then will order two-thirds yeah. of number one for issue two. And they'll order half again as much of number three. Yeah. It's only by the, when number three comes up that they actually start seeing, oh, this book is selling out. I should actually order more. Um, but it's the twos and the threes. There, there were over a million copies published of Spider-Man 2099 number one. Over a million copies of it. I swear, I've signed more copies of that book than anything. Mm. But number two and number three, much harder to find. Interesting. Uh, let's have some audience questions. Anybody uh, got a question for you? Yeah, Go ahead. With all the Marvel movies, have you been ever contacted to do a cameo in any of like the Hulk or Spider-Man? Oh, that's have, you, a, have you been contacted to be in one of the Marvel movies? That's a great question. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you go. Uh, anybody else? <laughs> go There's ahead. really nothing more to say about that, aside from the fact that I love Stan Lee's cameos. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those, you know, Stan, Stan's become like Alfred Hitchcock now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, he's going to have to start showing up in the first ten minutes because you're getting distracted sitting there watching and wondering where Stan's going to come in. Uh, the woman in the back there. Uh, would you talk about your Star Trek novels? Talk about sure. Your Star what do you want to know? I mean, that's a very general question. You know. Yes. How far back do you want me to go? I, mean, I read Q Squared. I loved there that you book. Go. That was a Q great Squared. book. Oh, God. Q Squared was fun. Q Squared was insane. Yeah. <laughs> because for some reason, I thought it would be a really good idea to bounce through three different universes and not actually have distinguishing ways of telling which universe is which. <laughs> and that was really insane, especially when I got two-thirds of the way into the book and all the universes collided. And suddenly I have three Picards running around the Enterprise and I'd forgotten to come up with a way to actually distinguish between <laughs> the three Picards. So that was brilliant. Um, 
Uh, the new frontier, which many people have wondered about, I'm actually for the first time in years talking with pocketbooks about doing new new frontier books, mm. which I'm very happy about because for the past three and a half years, it's been a matter of, hey, do you guys want to do more new frontier novels? And they're going, we'll get back to you. And they haven't. And now they finally got back to me. So I'm very pleased about that. So it looks like we will be, you know, with any luck, doing more new frontier novels. So I'm very excited about that. Cool. Uh, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, you go ahead. Speaking of Star Trek, how would it work worked out? to do the novel adaptations of the movies or the comic book tie-ins or other hard to do or easy? The comic book? Well, I've never done novel adaptations of the movies. I have done comic book versions. Doing a comic book version is very tricky because you don't have 120 pages of comic book to go with the 120 pages of screenplay. You have 48, 64 if you're lucky. So what you have to do as a writer is try to second guess what parts of the movie are people going to remember so that you go, because you're going to want to be sure to have those parts in your adaptation. Mm -hmm. So you have to actually try and figure out what are the things that people are going to come away from that film recalling. And that's a really tricky endeavor. I haven't done a lot of comic book adaptations of movies, but those that I have done, it's really a very fine line. I think actually, I think I did, I think I did Trek 5. Did I do Trek 5? Yeah. yeah, I did Trek 5, and I think we actually had William Shatner's original ending in the comic book, the one in which they're fighting a rock monster who they then wound up having in Galaxy Quest. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm completely serious. I am completely that. serious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> William Shatner's original script for Star Trek V ended with Kirk and company in a battle with a gigantic rock monster. And they actually tried filming footage of a guy in a rock monster costume, and no, not so much. <laughs> um, when they had the rock monster show up in Galaxy Quest, that was a deliberate tip of the hat to William Shatner's original ending for Trek V, which was much better than the one that they actually wound up filming, that they had to cut all of his really good stuff because of budget. But um, yeah, I, I think I actually had the rock monster fight in the comic book, so that was a lot of fun. Let's go. We have time for two more questions. If, go ahead, uh, right there. Mm -hmm. Are you a pop culture fan? Am I a pop culture fan? I don't think I'm any more of a pop culture fan than anybody else is. Um, I, will I will occasionally put on, I will occasionally put stuff in there that references pop culture because I just feel it's a natural thing for people to do. I mean, you know, my God, walk around this convention. It's a living testament to pop culture. Uh, people's T-shirts and clothing are all referencing, you know, various TV shows and all that kind of thing. Everyone has their pop culture influences. So, I will I will occasionally put in pop culture references. The only things that I have absolutely no frame of reference for are musical groups. And if I'm writing something which I feel a musical group has to be referenced, I will consult my wife and say, "Quick, I need a musical group." <laughs> Me, my 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 uh, my my tastes run towards Broadway show tunes. So if I'm going to have, which is why I was right in there with Shatterstar doing like, you know, Broadway tune references. <laughs> that was right in my wheelhouse. So but I'm not, not gay. Not, ex not exactly. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> not exactly a One Direction fan is what you're saying. No, it's exactly right. <laughs> uh, there was another man right here. Go ahead. So you were talking about screenplays and crossovers. Um, I was? Okay. Have you ever um, written uh, screenplays based on stories that you've written? Or yes. Have you written yes. screenplays based on your own work? Yeah, I wrote a screenplay for Nightlife. Um, and when I wound up, Nightlife was a book they wrote many, many years ago. And then I did a rewritten version of Nightlife some years later. And I actually wound up incorporating a number of things that I came up with for the screenplay into the rewritten version of Nightlife. Uh, nothing's happened with it. I also did a <laughs> screenplay based on the uh, book Howling Mad which is kind of my send-up of uh, modern uh, werewolf uh, legends. Uh, nothing's ever happened with them. I mean, it'd be nice, you know, if somebody wants to option them, come to my table and give me money, and I'll be happy to let you option them. Um, but nothing's happened with them, no. Um, 
The most recent screenplay I wrote was the sequel to After Earth. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that one. It was a really great screenplay. I mean, <laughs> if you say it, so yourself. Oh well, I I know. Um, <laughs> it was terrific. It had nothing to do with the first film. It was all set on the planet, and it was all this stuff that was happening, and it was all about how Jaden's character had now become a social media highlight because of everything that happened, and photographers were following him around, and all this cool stuff is really happening. And then the first movie tanked, and it didn't get made, oh. which really frustrated the hell out of me, because it would have rocked. <laughs> <laughs> One more question. One more question. You. Uh, Oh yeah. Uh, Talk about King and Yes. And like Absolutely. Yeah, talking about the Dark, Dark Tower. Tower. Yeah. We are going to be doing more Dark Tower. Oh wow. The the drawing of the three will actually be happening in comic book form. So we are very, very pleased about that. I literally just got an email about this two days ago. Um, and it's really funny. Would you like to know why we're doing more Dark Tower? Okay. No, well yes, <laughs> but okay. Funny story. <laughs> I had a stroke um, about a year and a couple of months ago, and I was in a recovery center down in Jacksonville, Florida, because I'd had the stroke down in Orlando, Florida, during our vacation to Disney World. Go to Disney World, have a stroke, and then go see Goofy. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're both going, <laughs> at any rate. Um, so I get an email from Robin Firth, who is my co-writer on, on Dark Hour, and she says, Stephen would like your email. Can I give him your email address? I'm going, sure. So I get an email from Stephen King, and Stephen says, um, I'd like to come up and visit you. You know, up in, the, up in the hospital. I'm down in Florida. And I went, okay, sure. And he drove up, and I thought that he was in Jacksonville. No, he was five hours away. Hmm. He did a five-hour drive to come up and see me because I think that he was really relating to the concept that I was having to teach myself how to walk again because he had to go through the same thing when he got hit by that van. So this was really in his wheelhouse. And while he was there, I said to him, you know, we should really do more Dark Tower because I get a lot of people coming up to me and saying, I want to see the drawing of the three. I want to see the next book. And Steve said, really? And I went, yeah. And he says, okay, we'll do that. And then he contacted Marvel Comics and, oh, we've got five minutes, okay. Or is that minutes or seconds? Minutes. <laughs> um, and he contacted Marvel and Marvel went, okay. And lo and behold, now we're doing Dark Tower again. So thank God I had a stroke. Yeah, something good came out of that. <laughs> yeah, really. That worked out great. All right, one more last question. Yeah. Uh, you, back there. You know, everyone keeps talking about how big the team in X Factor well, was. Big, more like diverse. Yeah, okay. Is, is, are you going to be adding more people to the new X Factor, or maybe some old, the new old team might show up? Or? What are you going to be uh, doing with the cast of X Factor? Um, well, the, uh, we have the current lineup. Um, we may be adding another person, uh, uh, an original <laughs> character who will be showing up with issue seven. Um, and we may be losing one of our cast members and bringing in somebody new. Um, but I'm going to keep it at the current number because I just feel that's a really good number to be working with at the moment. Peter? Yeah, now you, you had a question? Yeah, one more, yeah. Didn't you have a cameo in a movie that you wrote back during the uh, full moon movie day? I had cameos in a couple of them. Okay. I was in Trancers 4. <laughs> I came... <laughs> Jack Death has just managed to break free of his chains, and a nobleman yells, The prisoner! He's escaping! And I come running on, and Jack Death stabs me to death. <laughs> and I collapse. And I was a little bit daunted by that, because Tim Thomerson said, before we filmed it, Oh, I've always wanted to kill a writer. <laughs> <laughs> I also showed up in another movie that I wrote, you may have heard of it, Oblivion, yeah. which had nothing to do with Tom Cruise at all. It was about cowboys and aliens, which had nothing to do with another movie called Cowboys and Aliens. Um, and I'm, I can be briefly seen in the first Oblivion film. Uh, uh, I'm sitting on the, uh, the front of a, of, a, uh, of a bar, 
in like the first five or ten minutes, and I go running away when a character shows up. Um, my father has a much bigger cameo. My father is in Oblivion 2, Backlash. Uh, he's, 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 he's in a gro oh, that, that was, this was funny. I worked at a deal where he would, they were shot in Romania. And I worked at a deal where he would come with me to Romania. And I said, I'll get you a cameo in the film. And I asked the director about it, and he said, he has to have a beard. I want all the men in Oblivion to have beards. And I had never seen my father with anything more than five o'clock shadow in my life. But for this, he grew, he let his beard grow for five weeks. And he had a whole fiddler on the roof beard. <laughs> so the shot, so the sequence took place in the general store. And he's a customer in the store. And what I wrote into the script was that this character walks in whose name is Mr. Gaunt. Now, Mr. Gaunt was the local mortician. And the problem is that he's psychic. He knows when someone's going to die. So he shows up and waits for the person to fall over. The problem is, is that he also just has stuff to do. So whenever he goes anywhere in town, people go, holy crap, it's Mr. It's Mr. Gaunt. They all go running away. <laughs> so I had Mr. Gaunt come walking into the general store. My father's character sees him and goes running out of the store. <laughs> so when we're getting ready to film, my father says, so what are my lines? <laughs> I'm going, lines? He says, yes, what do I say? when I see Mr. Gaunt, and I said, give me a moment. And I went to the director, and I said, my father wants a line. <laughs> and he said, well, you're the writer. <laughs> give him a line. And I went back, and I said, OK, you're going to say, I think I'll come back later. And my father says, OK. So we filmed the scene, and Mr. Gaunt walks in. My father, who's been working on this thing, is like, no, I think I'll come back later. I think I'll come back later. He's doing the whole thing. He goes, I, I, I think I'll come back later, and runs out. And what was really great was he did that line. He did a couple of shots in the overall take. And then the director says, OK, Gunter, OK, uh, we need to move in for Gunter's close-up. And my father goes, I have a close-up. <laughs> Yes, Godfrey, you have a close-up. Oh now, you have to understand that my father came to this country when he was 19. And his reason for coming to this country was he wanted to be a movie star. Wow. He wound up becoming a reporter because he realized that he wasn't getting roles. Yeah. Um, but this was his lifelong dream, finally brought to fruition. How special. And, awesome. he, did, and he did his thing. They did his close-ups. I, I think I'll come back later. And they actually wound up using the close-up. And then when they were done with him, uh, the director said, OK, that's a wrap for Gunter David. Now, you have to understand that this was a bit part. It was a throwaway thing. You yell, that's a wrap for somebody when it's the star or a co-star or something like that. The director did it for my dad. He says, OK, ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap for Gunter David. And everyone starts applauding <laughs> like you're supposed to. And my father's going. <laughs> That's an excellent place to start. Now, here's, here's, oh, here's the right. best punchline. All right. The best punchline. I took lots of photographs. And this is back when we used this anti antiquated thing called film, yeah. right? And I brought, the, I brought the photos to a local place to have them developed. So I go to pick them up, and the guy says, and the guy says to me, these were taken on a movie set, weren't they? And I'm thinking, yeah, you figure that, because there's cowboys all over the place. And I said, yes, they were. And he says, because I recognized one of the guys. I said, really? And he showed me a group shot that I had taken of my father standing there with George Takei and Carl Stryken, who played Lurch in the Addams Family movies, and Jackie Swanson, who, who was in Cheers, who played Woody's eventual wife, right? And they're all standing there, and the guy in the camera store says, I recognize this guy. <laughs> and he points to my father. <laughs> didn't recognize George, didn't recognize Carl, didn't recognize Jackie. My father. That's awesome. He said, I've seen this guy in movies. He said, no, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have, definitely. I'm going, no, you really haven't. <laughs> but La that was fun. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Peter David. <laughs> Thank you. For those of you who are interested, I am down on level three. I'm, my table is JJ something. I don't remember what it is, but you can find it in the program book. I'm down there autographing until I have a panel at 420. So come on by and say hi. And 
I'm selling scripts. Um, I'm, I, have, um, I have scripts from X Factor and various Marvel titles. And I'm also selling scripts from two episodes of Young Justice that I wrote. The episode where Impulse shows up and the, ep the Halloween episode with Secret and Harm. So come on by. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Yep. I'm going blind. My mother was right. I should. Oh, wait. No, but the Dark Towers have you talked about. I, oh, yeah. I haven't heard anybody talk about that. That's oh, great. Yeah. Oh. Visited by Stephen King in the hospital. It had to be a surreal oh, that's, experience. Oh, it gets better. Listen. So I get it? I have to prep for my next interview. Okay. Ten minutes, but okay. I would love to I, hear. I'll tell you real quick. So I get an email. Now we're going to be leaving Jacksonville in, in like two days. Yeah. I get an email from them on Thursday after she says, about the police assistant. She says, Steve's worried about you. Hours. And I went, well, it's better than sitting on the phone waiting for three hours. So I went, okay. So 10 o'clock comes and goes, 11 o'clock comes and goes. Full morning, my phone rings. Hi, this is Delta. You are the next person we are going to talk to. And I went, great. And I sat there for half an hour, at which point I hung up. In the meantime, then in the morning, I get up and I've gotten another email from Stephen's assistant. He says, he just wants you to know, oh, that's my name. He wants you to know that this is not like some funnel chump. This is like a DC-10 corporate private jet. And by this point, I'm going, okay, yeah. screw it. And the cool thing was, I wound up, wound up getting the plane, and the plane left at 3 o'clock. Our Delta flight, which is supposed to leave at 3 o'clock, that left at 9 p.m. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, sir. Okay, I, you want some help, Dale? Yes. If you can just order that. Hi everyone, we'll get started shortly with some housekeeping stuff. Um, the room is very small, so if you have a cell phone, please silence it, turn it off. Um, we are also recording, um, and we don't want to disturb that. Um, that in mind, if you decide to leave during the panel, please be very careful of the door. Don't let it slam. Um, we'll sort of guide it in. If you guys could, if you have some empty seats, if you could scoot that way a little bit, just in case we get some more people coming, they won't be as disruptive. You don't need to necessarily, you know, right next to each other, but you guys on the aisle can sort of scoot over. Either way. Um, we do allow still photography, but no video recording, and please no flashes, so make sure those are off. Um, live streaming, I said that. I think that's it. Hope you guys are having a good day. Enjoy the, the panel.